Hello, welcome to season two of Image Bearers. This is episode 32. We have uh, with us uh, Mr. Angel Martinez, who leads the church in the Dominican Republic. And he also oversees uh, two other churches. Um, he's just an awesome, awesome brother, just getting to know him. So um, let's go ahead and start out. Why don't you go ahead uh, and introduce yourself uh, a little bit more detail about you and then also how God brought you into his kingdom. Well, first, just like I said earlier, Tuma, thank you. Just thank you for the opportunity to be here. Thank you, and just the opportunity just to be able to share. But um, like I said earlier, my name is Angel Martinez. Um, born and raised in New York, uh, uh, from Brooklyn. And uh, I was uh, converted there um, 1988 as a campus mm -hmm. student. Uh, a good friend of mine who I grew up with from across the street literally just came over to my house, talked to me about Jesus, like, let's go study the Bible. And then when I finally did start studying the Bible, it was about 10 days, 12 days later, I was baptized. Okay. Uh, you know, it's been, been the best decision I made uh, uh, in, in my life. But um, I, uh, you know, I always saw myself as a New Yorker, never saw myself anywhere else. I always said, I leave this city feet first. And uh, so I, I find it funny that now I'm here in the, uh, in the Caribbean, but, uh, but I love where I am. I feel like the scripture says my, my borders have fallen in pleasant places. Sure, sure, sure. So I was listening to, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, a podcast, uh, Rob Skinner's podcast, which I love. And um, he just talks about, um, I think you shared on his show, uh, basically how you got into the ministry and ended up leading the church in the D Dominican Republic. And I think it's kind of a funny, but also an inspiring story. Can you please share about that a little bit? Yeah, it's, um, it's not your typical <laughs> way that you get into the ministry. But um, Long story short, uh, there was uh, preparation in the church in New York. Uh, they were looking to plan to lead to to plant the church in the Dominican Republic. Uh, mm -hmm. I knew some of the people who were on the mission team, and they they said they needed help. I was studying film at the time, and so they said they needed help with the video. I kind of led songs at my sector, and so I said, okay, I can help with the Spanish songs. I can help with the videos, and that was my one and only intent. Right, uh, right. I had other aspirations, you know my. My other dreams were more, I wanted to be an intern at church in New York, maybe go to Africa because, you know, we were the aces back then. So that's what we were Yes, doing. yes, yes, yes. So that was my, that was my dream. That's where I wanted to go, you know, or, or be in New York. Mm -hmm. And um, some, a good friend of mine who was the one in charge of kind of putting the team together, mm -hmm. uh, Steve Rivera tells me, um, they come, they're coming down to the last meetings, uh, you know, before the team is going to go. And he's like, listen, I think you need to go, bro. Why don't you just go to me? And I was like, why am I going to go? You, I, I have no desire on going. I was even kind of the black sheep of the mission team. People were like, you need to go back to your home. You need to go back. I'm like, I'm, I'm not from DR. My, my mom's from, <laughs> from Puerto Rico. I'm from Brooklyn. I'm sorry. I just don't. It, it wasn't, I can't say it was on my radar. And um, so I went to that meeting. It was at Steve Johnson's house. And uh, we're going, you know, they, we're eating some, uh, some Dominican food that somebody made. And and Steve asked a question, um, who, why are you interested in going? Why do you want to be on this mission team? So I'm like, he's obviously not going to ask me because he knows I'm not interested in going. But so I'm in a corner eating my food. And um, as he goes around, he asks me, so Angel, why do you want to go on the mission team? I was like, um, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I am here to support. I am here to support. That's what I'm here to do. And, and I remember him telling me, he says, Angel, but you know, he says, would you consider it? And I said, listen, Steve, I'm, I'm, I'm a disciple. I, I'll, you know, I go where we go, do whatever, sell whatever. I'm a disciple. If you tell me I have to go, I will go. Now, if you ask me, uh, and that's why I figured I'd throw in my pitch. I said, I really want to be an intern in the church here. That's, what really, that's really what I want to do. And kind of put that in his ear. And I always remember, because I felt like for the next three days, I felt like Steve sent demons after me um, because I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep well the next three days. Uh, Kept thinking about was the mission team, the need, uh, all these different things, and and mind you, in all this time, I'm thinking I'm going to go as a mission team member. I'm just going right. to go, and so then I get a call. I finally make the decision. I call him, the person discipling me at the time, Chris, and I, and I said, "Listen, I'm going to go. I'm going to go. I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm fearful. I'm in the middle of university. All my family is here. I my Spanish is pretty bad, um, but I'm going to go." So then I get a call the next day from Steve Johnson saying, come over to my place with Chris. And 
he's packing for a trip and he says, listen, I got, um, I got some great news for you. And I said, really? So I'm here thinking, you know, you, you know what I'm thinking I'm going to hear. And uh, New York. Yeah. Yeah. I think he's like, your, your dream has come true. He says, you are going to be an intern in, in the Steve Johnson style. <laughs> intern with the church in New York. And, uh, and I was like, hey, man, that is awesome. And I'm, I'm thinking, I'm glad I said what I said to him. He says, yeah, you're going to be an intern for three days. And I'm like, that's, that's not funny. <laughs> that's, not, that's, that's not funny. You, you don't play with people's dreams. And he's like, yeah, because then after those three days, you're going to go down and lead the church in the, the Dominican Republic, the mission team. You know, when you go blank, um, mm -hmm. you just become deaf. You just, every, your world starts turning and you're like, huh, wait, what, what do you, um, everything after that pretty much is a blur. <laughs> right, right. And um, it wasn't three days later, but it was about uh, 10 to 12 days later. Mm -hmm. uh, after going to one staff meeting, I was on a plane uh, to lead the mission team in June of 1994. So, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's the, uh, yeah. So I got baptized in December of 1994. Okay. Uh, so yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's awesome. That's a lot of years. That's a lot of years. Um, so yeah, I know obviously, you're, like I said, you lead the church in the Dominican Republic and you're overseeing really the Caribbean. Um, so my understanding is the church went from 18 disciples uh, in 19, was that in 1994 when you guys started? Okay, in 1994 to you know 900 or so. So can you share some of the highlights over the years that have occurred as far as the growth of the church and different things going on? I think you're, uh, is it on mute? <clears throat> we lost sound. Lost the sound? Yep, it's back. Okay, all right. Um, yeah, uh, it was, a, you know, the church didn't stay small uh, for very long. Mm -hmm. We were, it was in, church started with 18, June 94, finished December with about 49. And then, you know, we ended 95 with 110, 96 with 220. Wow. By the time year 2000 rolled around, we were close to about 800 uh, disciples at that time. Um, Luce and I were sent to Puerto Rico and you know, God bless their hearts, but a, a couple who had went from basically leading the team ministry <laughs> went to leading the church. And right. uh, it was a lot. It was overwhelming. And the reality is um, we built uh, faster than what we could ourselves sustain. It was, mm -hmm. it, it just it surpassed us. It surpassed our staff. It surpassed our maturity. It surpassed my training, all those different things. And so come back in 2003, um, and I guess over the next couple of years, the church had gone, had dwindled down to about 450, 460 members. Mm -hmm. um, but yet, you know, God was, God was faithful and we just kept going at it. We lost our support. That was the other thing. Uh, 2003, the church lost completely its support. But we decided God is faithful. We're going to figure this out somehow. And um, what was great is in 2005, we decided we're going to start a new region. We had people from the east of Santo Domingo, so there was a new region. It's now, uh, that was about, you know, 30 something at that time. It's now 200 people. And then, uh, and then in 2006, we said, well, we're going through a tough time, but we got we to gotta think about other people on this island. And mm -hmm. uh, so we went to the second largest city and planted a church during one of the worst economic times. <laughs> Maybe sure. it was worse than <laughs> what we're going through now. But at that time, it was a recession. And we planted a church in Santiago, the second largest city. And then in okay. 2008, we said, we're going to go to La Romana. And we're gonna we're gonna plant the church there in the east part of the of the island, and um, through that, and I think through God's faithfulness and the faithfulness of the disciples and just staying focused, uh, God has allowed us to come back. We're almost almost a thousand disciples on the island today. That's awesome. So I know that uh, like for me, when I listen to the podcast, like I said, Rob Skinner, and even just getting a chance to chat with you now, you seem like a very personable, approachable person. Uh, someone, you know, we can just definitely hang out with and have a good time. Um, and I was wondering, where do you think that comes from? Um, well, great, great question. <laughs> <laughs> I laughed when I read it. Um, I'd have to say my dad. Okay. Everyone who I, um, who meets my dad says, oh, I know where you got it from. Got you it. Know, since, since the time I was a kid, 
my dad has always been the kind of person who just talks a lot with people, people mm-hmm. he doesn't even know, and and just endears himself to them. He, he, he's a joker. He's a joker and a half. Mm-hmm. And my dad from quite a few years worked as a as a postman in New York, so he was always in and out of people's you know businesses or people's homes, getting to know neighbors. Yeah. Uh, my personality it, it, and my way of being is definitely it's definitely my dad. It's, it's a, I thank God. It's one of those you know, great things I could say I, I, I got from my dad. So do you think that has translated into the church in some respects? Um, and if so, how? Yeah, I think, um, I think in many ways it has, it has translated into the church because um, I think one of the things about my dad and one of the things I learned is, is he's, he's approachable. He's, he's, you know, you, you feel like, oh, I can, I can talk with him. I, I, I've known him for a long time. We, you know what I mean? And, and I think it's been good <laughs> Because um, in general, I guess the Latino culture, there's this thing about pastors, and you know they kind of you know stand off, yeah, out there, and you don't really, you know, you don't even call them by their name; you call them pastor. You know what I mean? It's like, right. And I think it's helped, especially in our culture, the people know you can come up to me, we can talk, you can share what you're thinking, and and and, and you know, and, and, and there's a good side to that. There's a not so good side to that. You're, you know, you hear things you agree with, you hear other things you don't agree. With. But I think the thing that I've gotten most, I think it's helped because people feel that they're heard. Mm-hmm. People feel like you're approachable and not necessarily you're going to agree with them on everything, but that you, you will listen to them. Right. I think it's enriched me a lot because I think I've, there are things that other people in the church have mentioned that I didn't even consider. Right. Uh, they didn't even come to mind. I'm like, whoa, mm-hmm. I, I didn't even see it that way. I didn't even consider it that way. So I think as a leader, it's made me wiser. It's mm-hmm. made me smarter. And I think it's made people, but at the same time, I think the, it's, it's made people feel like if I've got something, if I have a concern, I can talk about it. That's you good. Know? And so I think it's helped to, to help. And like I said, and especially in this culture where pastors are like, we don't, you know what I mean? It's, it's mm-hmm. to know that, yeah, we can talk. Come, have a seat. Let's talk. And it's like, oh, wow. And the pastor is actually sitting down and talking with me. Like, yeah. And you don't offend me if you call me by my name. <laughs> right. So how, how, how have you been able to, or what have you done, I guess, to be able to translate that to like our times now where everything is, you know, social distance and the Zoom? How have you been able to, or what have you done to try to keep those relationships and that, you know, personable spirit, if you will? It's taken a lot more work, but um, I think one thing, I was already doing before, but I'm, I, fi- I find myself doing this more now. For example, um, we use a lot of WhatsApp. Okay. WhatsApp a lot here. And um, the cool part about it is, you know, you can leave your written message, you can leave an audio. I, I tend to leave more audio messages. And I just like, you know, like this week, one of the guys who got recently married, you know, uh, more, uh, months back, was going through some tough time. And I'm like, hey, what's up? Talk to me. What's going on with you? <laughs> you know, catch me up. Uh, and I leave a lot of those kind of messages with people, um, young disciples, people who, you know, who, who we had baptized right before, you know what I mean? The mm-hmm. COVID and everything going on. And I'm just like, how you doing? How are things going? Leave me a message, hit me back. And that's kind of my way of, uh, of keeping up, you know, because, you know, the Zooms are great, but it's usually a big group and everybody kind of talking over one another. But this, though, that's kind of my way of doing it, where mm-hmm. I, I drop you a message. I'm thinking about you. What's going on? You know what I mean? How are you? What's that's, that's been my way of, of, of kind of letting people know. No, that's helpful. And I think even just setting up this uh, interview, I know you sent me a note, uh, a, a, an audio. So I was like, that's, that's kind of cool. I think that's a great way, as you mentioned, to kind of keep up with people. So at the beginning of the church, I know one of the things it seems like you guys focused on a lot was campus ministry. And obviously the church grew, you know, so many ways from that. Can you share some of the things that you guys did at the beginning of the church with the campus ministry that really helped it grow? I think the volume is gone again. Okay, that's back now. Okay, I don't know why there's kind of a delay, but mm-hmm. at the beginning of the campus ministry, um, at the church, we we had, we, when the church started, we uh, I think we had interns that were just gonna be there for a few months and then they were gonna either go back to New York and then later on we were able to hire some people, but basically, it was everyone who was on staff 
Mm -hmm. As an intern, you did campus of the day and you did whatever other ministry you were doing at night. Got I mean, it. That was basically, I lived, it was, it was go out, be in campus all day, come home, try to get the sweat and the dirt, you know what I mean, of everything <laughs> off of you, and then yeah. singles, singles at night or married at night. Yeah. Now, mind you, part of the reason why we're able to do this is because um, I came, my, my, I came to lead the church as a single. Uh, my 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 co-leader is now my wife, but that was three years. That was three years later after we planted the, the church. Right. So the membership of the church was for the first three years. Uh, I probably would say four or five years was probably ninety-seven percent singles and campus students. That was the makeup of the church. People would come to church and they go, "Is this a youth ministry?" <laughs> And, and the guy and the old guy leading them is, you know, 27 years old. <laughs> right, right, right. But it was that kind of, it was that kind of focus. And it's been, and even now, um, mm -hmm. if I could share this, uh, one thing, because our campus had a high point, you know, maybe 200 something students. And then our, our campus dropped to about maybe five students. Uh, oh, wow. Okay. Yes. Years later. And what happened? We, um, we connected. We're good friends. I'm good friends with Josue Ortega. Mm -hmm. and, uh, from uh, and he said they're having a you know a growing campus ministry in Central America. He says, "Why don't we do something where we get students to come on over? Mm. We get students to come on over for a week, and it's just we're going to hit the campus every day, do three or four Bible talks, start studies. We'll come in on a Sunday. We'll do Monday through Friday. Then we have a hangout on Saturday, and then it'll be a campus led service on Sunday. That's awesome. Tell you something. Um, we were about there was about eight students on campus at that time. Mm -hmm. This was about three years ago. And that week was amazing. Just for the faith of the students. Mm -hmm. because what, what the, the older ones of us were telling them oh, back in our days. and yeah, yeah, yeah. They saw it for themselves. Mm -hmm. it was a story. It was in an example in a sermon. They saw 40, 50 people at a Bible talk. They saw three, 400 studies in a week. They mm -hmm. saw people baptized. And so from that group of 80, there are almost close to 80 campus students today. That's awesome. And, um, and it's been, so it's cool to like, because, you know, back in the day is great, but it, to see a ministry resurrect. Right. Is I think something that gives a lot of hope to people. That's awesome. That's awesome. So I know obviously you oversee the, the churches in the Caribbean. Um, if you were to like articulate your vision, how would you, I guess, explain and kind of go through that? It keeps cutting out. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Go why. ahead. Go ahead. I think maybe when you get away from the computer, maybe that's what it is. Okay. Let me. I'll. I'll, yep. I'll make you stay close. But um, I think. You know, the Caribbean is. We've got 13 different nations represented where we have churches. Uh, okay. About 30, about 32 churches, uh, all together. It's about 3,200 disciples, and eight of those 13 are led by non full time. Oh, wow. Okay. Idea. So when we get together for our meetings, we usually have our meetings twice a year. It's trying to work around the schedules of those who are working, their kids, uh, yeah. their, jobs, their meetings, all that. And I, these, and I appreciate these brothers and sisters. Sure. Because they are volunteers and they give it the best they can. So you can obviously see from there one of our major needs. Yeah. Which is the, um, strengthening existing churches. You know, um, hiring ministers where we can we can train and hire ministers to lead these churches so that these churches can really begin to grow in the way in the best way possible. So is it people or money or both as far as hiring ministers full time? Both. OK. Both. Uh, in some cases, in some cases, we got the people, but we don't have the money. In some cases, we have, you know, what I mean? we have the money, but we don't have sure. the people. It's it's, it's per island that the situation changes, but it's a combination of both. OK. Of what's needed. I think the other thing, uh, as far as the vision of being able to appoint elders in our in our region of, uh, of the world, we don't we don't have elders in the Caribbean. I believe we will have over the next few years. But the Caribbean is an interesting thing because um, we've got four different languages. You have Dutch, French, English, and Spanish. I wouldn't have thought Dutch. Yeah, the Dutch. When you when you think about um, when you think about Suriname, when you think about uh, okay uh, Aruba and uh, Bonaire. 
That's you've got the Dutch speaking right there. And um, so you've got these four different languages, makes, which makes for a really interesting meeting when we get together. Oh yeah, and some great food too, I'm sure. <laughs> some really, some really good food, really good times, and and and, and it's amazing. But we have these, so we have these challenges. So even elders is just not just in one language, but in all these different languages. And mm. so uh, that's another sounds like sounds like the kingdom of God. Yeah, it, <laughs> I love it. honestly, I love it. it it's <laughs> a great combination when we get together so that would that's one of our one of my visions um obviously we got to plant the other islands that are still uh, that are still left over i think it's close to about 20 more some of them are smaller in population but you know we've got those but that's the reason why we in my next my next point as far as the vi vision for it is our campus ministry yeah in caribbean <laughs> many students um go to these different islands that have these major universities, which is called UE, U University of the West Indies. And they, they go from these different islands and they go to these universities to study. Mm -hmm. That is a mission field in and of itself. We can plant churches through students who go back to mm -hmm. their islands. There's a concept. There you go. You know what I mean? We, we train them, hire them, help them out, set them up, and let's see what we can do that to, to, as far as evangelizing the rest of these other islands. Yeah. That is key for our future leadership, and I think it's key for the churches that we're going to plant in the future, because on some of these islands, there are certain regulations that, that don't allow for just anybody just to go there and just live there. But if these students are ready from there, I, I think the Lord's just providing an open door that we just got to go through it. That's awesome. That's awesome. I was listening to, I guess, listen to a few podcasts. I listened to uh, Mike Burns' podcast, uh, All Things to Old People. And he talks about, you know, millennials, Generation Z, and just trying to make sure that they are really uh, feeling this is their church and really embracing it. So that, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, so I know that obviously you've been a disciple many years. Um, how, how many years specifically, I guess? Is it cutting out again? <laughs> I was going to say uh, 32. 32, 32 years. Okay, wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, so how do you stay motivated over the years and inspired? What are some secrets? Um, that is the, the, the constant challenge. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think for me personally, um, it's, I need, I need that. I, for, for me, it's, I, I, I do a lot of, I, I go walk and pray. Yep. It's, um, it's it, it gets me out. I just love, you know, the, the color of the sky, the green, just mm. being able to get out there. And, and I feel like when I walk and pray, I leave it out there. Right. You know, it's, it's, um, I think I shared this in, in, in Rob's podcast. I mean, if, if, if my walk, if that road could talk, if it, it would have a lot to say. About. Yes, 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 yes. That's you, awesome. You know, and, but it just, that is for, for me, prayer is the thing that energizes me. It, mm -hmm. it, it unloads me. It makes me feel better it makes me feel like wow okay I, I can i can go at this again you know and and, and obviously you know the scriptures and just I, I try to listen you know obviously getting into the word but just trying to listen to some great preaching and uh and teaching but i think for me it's constantly keeping myself in that when i when i get distracted when i get disconnected it gets hard it gets hard i feel like it's a it's a hard road back mm -hmm. but I, I think as far as what keeps me it's Somebody told me when I, when I was a young Christian, it, you, you never get away from the basics. You never, you know, the, the basics right. will always be the basics. Right. You know, your Bible, prayer, staying open, you know, mm -hmm. being involved in other people's lives. Those, mm -hmm. those are the things for me that, that help me, that keep me going. Yeah, I think you also mentioned um, relationships. Like, I think you mentioned, like, going to a conference, ACR, through Mike Fontenot, just different things like that. Uh, which is a little bit harder in some senses these days, but I think staying connected is definitely very, very important. So what are some of your favorite scriptures and or passages um, that you've uh, just covered in, in, in your time as a disciple? Um, I was thinking about that. I was like, you know. <laughs> That's a hard one, I know. For especially for a preacher, you know how it is. You go, oh, this is one of my favorite stories. It is my favorite <laughs> scripture. I mean, they're just... Um, you know, I, I think about Romans 8, where it just talks about, you know, in all things, uh, God works for the good or all things work together. Mm -hmm. for the love of, I 
you know, if you, for me, I have more favorite stories of the Bible. I love the underdogs of the Bible. Yeah. Of uh, the Gideon, the Moses, yeah. uh, Peter, because those are the guys I can relate with. Like, I mean, yeah. got issues, jacked up. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Stuff they need to work through. Good times, bad times, get up, fall down. But what I love about them is because I said, if they can do it, then I can. I, I, I serve the same God. And mm-hmm. it, it's, it, you know how I think in scripture, we try to find someone who looks like us, someone who's who's like us in character in the way that they think. Right. And, but for me, those guys, um, like I said, they're different scriptures, but it's more the stories. Mm-hmm. Of the people. Um, you know, the Joshua chapter one, you know what I mean? Uh, be strong and courageous. You know, I tell you again, <laughs> mm-hmm. we can't mission team that was I was studying out that chapter because that's how I felt I felt afraid mm-hmm. for this. and so for me it's it's those characters in the Bible that that resound with me I mean there's the Paul he's awesome and all those other guys you know what I mean but those guys the, you know what I mean the yeah the, the, the underdogs yeah Gideon is a favorite he's got so many issues but uh God uses him in a powerful way what are some of your favorite books as in like outside of the Bible but like you know um what what are you reading you got to come a little closer again i think it <laughs> i'm not sure yeah here we go okay one of my one of my favorite books is um you know how you have books that you go back to yeah yeah, yeah. oh yeah Here's, those are good ones yeah the good ones one of them is um spiritual leadership as well okay Sam. okay yeah 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 for me, it's a book that I, I tend to go back to over and over again, just because of the different things that it teaches about. More than leadership, it's about your relationship with God and who who you need to be and how that then affects how you are with serving others. Right. Others. So for me, that that is a classic. I mean, um, I've got one version that's like so in such bad shape that I had to get another one to kind of, you know what I mean? But I keep the first one for everything I underlined under it. Um, I think that's that's one book. I think um, Gordon Ferguson wrote a book. Um, I think it was Golden Rule Leadership uh, some time back. Yeah. And I was in Puerto Rico at the time that I read it. And I guess it was a crucial time mm-hmm. um, for me. And it was, you know how you have books that kind of change the way we think, the mm-hmm. way you see things? That was one of those books Okay. for me. And I think... Um, and there was another book, but it's funny, all these books go to times in my life that I was going through stuff. There's this book, it was a very popular book. It was called um, uh, The Painful Side of Leadership. Huh. Okay. I think the, the, uh, I think the author was uh, Igor, I-G-O-R, something like that. But it was The Painful Side of Leadership. And I was going through some stuff. And uh, that book for me was like, okay, this is this is good for me. This is, yeah. this is good. So it would, it helped me out a lot to let me know, okay, it just wasn't me. It just wasn't stuff I was going through, um, but stuff that everybody goes through. Mm-hmm. This movement, that movement, whatever it is, everybody goes through it. And so that for me has been kind of, you know, I guess there's those different books that kind of touch me at different points. Mm-hmm. I think some of the really popular ones right now in the U.S., and it may be similar to, you know, where you are, is some of Mike Burns' books, uh, Michael Burns. Uh, whether it's, you know, old things to old people, crossing the line or escaping the beast. Have you guys looked at any of those or? I've seen, I can't, I can't say I've read any of them, but I've seen uh, some of them. And, um, and I know I've seen, I think Michael Burns, has, I don't know if he's done some videos. Yeah. Uh, recently, yeah. And, and I've gotten a chance to see some of the videos. Okay, cool, cool, cool. All right. So I know that uh, obviously um, this is probably a little bit of a challenging question and obviously requires uh Humility, but I think at the same time, you know, it helps for us to just be forthright. Uh, I know you've been a disciple, as you said, I think 32 years. You lead, um, really, the, you oversee the Caribbean churches and then the three churches in the Domin- Dominican Republic. Um, so I think you do have, you know, a, a standing to provide some, I think, very useful insight um, for our family of churches. So if you were to say, you know, what are maybe one or two things that you think we as churches could work on what what would what would your response be i think i mean the one big thing that comes to mind and obviously without generalizing and and, and i speak from my little corner sure. uh, my little corner of the world here i think 
one of the things that I, I guess I've seen, I guess, just in conversations and different things like that, it's, it's, you know, there, there's less, less, less lessons that we've had to learn from the past, mistakes mm -hmm. that we've made, things that we could have done better, you know what I mean? Things that we need to improve. Um, and, and I think learning the lessons from the past, yet moving forward in faith. Yes. Moving forward in faith in, in some circles, sometimes I feel like we, we do a lot more talking um, and, and, and it's a lot less faith and a lot less doing. And, 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 and I think sometimes in our, and I know we don't want to make the same mistakes of the past, but I think it's kind of inevitable, inevitable. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to make new mistakes. Um, but that shouldn't hold us back from moving forward. Um, and, and, and I think uh, one of the things that I think we can work on is that is, is really moving forward by faith. I think one of the things that distinguished us as a movement uh, many times back, it was that is mm -hmm. the moving forward by faith. I, I got into the ministry. I came out here, somebody chose me, uh, you know what I mean? The Five-year-old disciple who had been in and out of leadership on three different occasions um, with a whole lot of issues. And, and yet the Lord was still able to, to work. And, and, mm -hmm. and again, it's, it's saying, let's learn from the past, but let's make sure we're not trying to move forward with the emergency break on. Good um, point, good analogy. Yep. And I, I, I think we can sometimes err too much on the side of caution. And um, yeah, that, that, that's, what, that's, that's the big one thing that I, that I would say um, is that it's learning a lesson from the past, but let's move forward with faith, man. Let's, God can do stuff. We're going to mess up. We're going to make new mistakes and that's okay. Mm -hmm. And we'll learn from them. And, 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 but, but wow, there's, I believe there's so much can be done and perhaps so many people can be given an opportunity mm -hmm. so you know like i said without generalizing because there's definitely places where there's a lot of that going on but i think that's kind of what i see from my like i said my, my standpoint in this little part of the world so maybe take the brakes off make new bold mistakes and keep learning as we go kind of a thing exactly because that's basically yeah that's just going to be lesson for life that's 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 not a a one-time thing. It's not a. It's not a thing of the past. It's a, we're going to keep making new mistakes. Mm -hmm. I think we, we got to be known. And again, without generalizing, known not not so much for what we don't stand for, but but what, what we do stand for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what we do go forward, and we, you know what I mean. Like I said, moving forward, take the emergency break off. Let's let's be wise. We're we're older. We're smarter. We can help out. You know. But mm -hmm. let's 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 move forward by faith. Good faith. Yeah, man. So um, just wrapping it up, a couple few questions to wrap it up here. Um, how are the churches doing just in general with COVID-19? How are you guys navigating things? Yeah, I think for the, for the most part in the Caribbean, most churches are doing well. The majority of the churches in the Caribbean are doing well. Though um, some of the larger islands, it's been a bit more challenging. Us here in the Dominican Republic, we're kind of going through our second wave at this point. Okay. It's, um, we're still not meeting. We don't believe in second ways, man. America, we just wanna, we just wanna keep going, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Forget the second wave. It's just the continuation of the first. Crazy, exactly. Yeah, it's here. I mean, the reality is that there wasn't really a big first wave because people listened when the first time it came through. Everybody picked up, and it was like okay, and, and there was a serious lockdown. But then once we went into phase one, you know what I mean, kind of phase two. Then yeah, we didn't hear any cases in the church, and then. We've had at least here in DR uh, about at least 30 cases. Luckily, uh, no deaths, but you know, there's been definitely at least 30 cases. And, and then speaking as far as the rest of the islands, it's, it's no disciples, uh, no deaths as far as that is concerned, but there's definitely been family members, extended family yeah, members yeah. that have died. And you know, the, the Zoom, Zoom funerals, uh, just, those yeah. kind of, just those kind of things. So that's, that's, been, that's been challenging, that's been challenging. And as a, culture as a, as a Caribbean culture we love being around one another we love being oh, sure, sure. yeah you know what I mean and, and it's so it's so contrary mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's it's been challenging I think in different ways but we're trying to encourage one another mutually mm -hmm. you know I thank God as far as COVID I think for the most part the churches are you know do, doing well moving forward very thankful for hope loaves and fishes oh yeah 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 Reese Nealon I think and and now I guess uh Barnett yeah, now it's Barnett, yeah, but a lot of help where people, 
people were day, day laborers and just they were whatever they worked that day is what they made. And so that helped and it's continued to help me a lot of the cycles. That's awesome. That's awesome. So um, I'm, obviously I know you're, you're, you're married to Lewis, right? Loose. Loose, loose, yes. loose. And then um, you have a little one too? Yeah, I have a son named Joseph. He's six years old. Joseph, good name, good name. <laughs> six, okay. What do you guys do for fun? Well, I mean, <laughs> pre-pandemic, pandemic, <laughs> pre-COVID or post-COVID. Uh, <laughs> I a little I, both, a little bit of both. Well, I mean, we. Uh, I'm gonna put it. We're both Luce and I. We're we're big movie fans. We love going to the movies. I mean, we're just yeah. We're, we 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 love going to movies, going out to eat, and um, and both and both traveling. So. And with our and with our son, you know, we can take take him along, and so we've got good friends in a lot of you know New York and different parts of the U.S. So we've had a chance to go spend time with them, hang out, and that that for us is fun. Uh, we have a lot of fun with that, and um, and I think the other thing is now post post COVID, we've kind of had to figure it out, and I, I think we got kind of a rhythm. We've got a we got a little bubble of, of families, you know, we got about two or three families. And it's been good because twice we've been able to get away, just kind of go on a little mini vacation uh, to the countryside in DR and, and, and then spend time. And so we're there, you know, for four or five days and no masks and, and just kind of hanging out with one another. And uh, that, that, that's been good. It makes you feel normal uh, again. But that's kind of what we've done, especially with our son who's six years old. And so it's needing other kids to be around just to play. And for the adults, for us, I mean, just to have a break, just to, you know, to talk with one another. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's kind of been, that's kind of what we've been doing uh, for fun. I think most recently we're, we're, I think, venturing out to the park now and, uh, you know, where we can, we can keep our distance from people, but yet still, you know, our son could go out and play and we can do stuff with other families. But that's what we've been doing is basically two or three other families that we stay close with. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and, and they... And, and, and you know, we have their kids over, they come on over, we have them together, that kind of stuff. It's just been good. Just is that is that kind of common in the Dominican Republic that you have two or three families that you kind of have like, a, I don't say a pact, but whatever, where you guys are more comfortable and you kind of let the guard down? I know Canada has something like that, that they've, I mean, I'm sure people do that, but is that kind of common or? As far as COVID is concerned? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think I've seen, how can I put it? I think it's something that just kind of caught on. People okay. were, were seeing pictures of, uh, you know, people would put stuff on Facebook and you would see these two or three families together like on vacation. So I think some other people were like, hey, you know what? Let's do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and it just kind of caught on where people were like, okay, you know what? Let's grab these two or three families together and let's do this. And it's been, and I've kind of seen it. And then I've heard of plans later on. I can't say it was anything that was kind of, you know, talked about or given as an idea. I think it was just something that people kind of caught on and started doing where they want to spend time with one another, but yet still know, okay, uh, you, you, okay, you take care of yourself. I know you stay safe. Okay. <laughs> yeah. 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 I got one last question before we wrap it up. I know obviously um, you knew Wilner uh, Cornelly and I wanted to just uh, see if you could maybe just share a few things just about, you know, your time together and uh, just, you know, your interactions and, and so forth. Yeah, I mean, Wilner, Wilner and Chantel, our, um, our uh, interactions, was, like I was telling you earlier, was kind of split in two different moments. As, uh, for them, they were, I remember them, uh, I was the new, one of the new kids on the Caribbean. They were the kind of older big brother and big sister that were there. And, and uh, it, it was great. We didn't get a chance to spend a lot of time with them. They were only with us, you know, about a year and a half, two years. But, um, but I remember always admiring him in that, wow, he was a tough mission field, Haiti, uh, when it was going through a lot of stuff, you know what I mean? Papa Doc, Baby Doc, and all these different things that were happening. And he and his wife, they held down the fort with their kids and everything. I still remember in the book, uh, Teach Us to Pray, they had that uh, one section that he was sharing and taking his kids to midweek on the motorcycle. And, you know, it just was like, wow. <laughs> it's another world it's another world it's another life you know and and so to see that and that was my, my first time connecting with him then hearing of of his many journeys mm -hmm. you know 
and then having him come back. Uh, mm -hmm. it was, That's it, right. Yeah, Jamaica. Yeah. Yeah, he came. He came back, and we, we didn't know if he was going to come back to go to Haiti. But then they wanted it worked that way. He was going to go to Jamaica, and just seeing years later that same faith, mm -hmm. that, that same heart to serve, that same okay, the situation is tough, people, but you know what? God is bigger. Mm -hmm. God is bigger. And I remember Luce and myself, we went to see him when he was in New York when he was getting cancer treatment. Mm -hmm. And it was like, it was like different people that, you know, stories like we've heard. You go visit somebody, you're going to encourage them. You're the one who leaves encouraged. Mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. And that's how it was. That's how it was with Wilmer. And um, we were there, you know, went to see him and, and he, he was, you know, was going through his stuff, but his attitude, he, he, and he was talking to me about, okay, how's the ministry? How's Jamaica? How's the Caribbean? How, it, it wasn't, we're going to sit down here and talk about me. No, talk to me. What's going on with so-and-so? You know, names, you know, <laughs> that yeah. was, that was, that was his thing. And that's how, and that's how I remember him. You know, um, uh, fond memories of, of Wilmer, fond memories, a man of faith, a uh, man of deep conviction, a man who loved his family, you know, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not, you know, you don't get a chance to meet and spend time with people like that often. Yeah. Yeah, so I was actually in the ministry with him. We were together in, in Johannesburg, South Africa. So I was like an intern. And I remember we had a, uh, we all kind of came together as a region, like region leader, you know, everyone in our region, like the region leaders in our ministry. And it was kind of like, hey, the, the ministry is not doing so well. You know, uh, what do you guys think the issue is? And Wilmer just took off his glasses, you know. In Wilmer style. <laughs> yeah, he just started crying. And he just was like, you know what? I really didn't want to step on toes was essentially what he was saying. But as more I could have done, but I didn't want to kind of like rock the boat and come off wrong in a sense. And I was just like, wow. And then I remember when I was in uh, Lesotho, you know, he wrote me a letter and just encouraged me. But no, just a great, just a great brother. Yeah, definitely. definitely. Yeah. The prophet. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Look forward to the day where we can fellowship. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for your time. It's definitely uh, been an honor. We'll definitely have to see how we can maybe have you uh, back on the show in a, a year or so with your wife and get a chance to chat some more. I know she's out of out of the country right now. Yeah. No. No. And she and she and she's great. I, I could just sit on the side while you interview her. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we'll do that. I think it's you. You shared everything so far. So, <laughs> well, uh, thanks so much. We'll definitely uh, be communicating. Uh, those of you who enjoyed the episode, please click like and please consider subscribing to the show. Thank you.